everybody and welcome to today's webinar. We're glad to have you here. Today we will be discussing filtering in vibration testing. Filtering is necessary when processing vibration signals during a shaker test. It ensures that the controller performs operations on the correct data, thus properly controlling the test. Filtering also helps the engineer process the pertinent data and filter out the rest. Today, we'll briefly discuss the filters applied during sampling for analog to digital conversion. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time on digital signal processing filters for sign, random, and shock testing. First, let's review a general definition. In vibration testing, filtering is an operation that rejects or accepts data components based on frequency. Filters are designed to attenuate or boost specific frequency components. Typically, engineers use filtering to narrow their analysis to a specific frequency range, remove noise, or extract only relevant information. Some examples include filtering out a DC offset or a constant offset, filtering out 60 hertz noise or notching, filtering out components outside of a microphone, accelerometer, or other transducers specifications, smoothing a noisy data sequence by attenuating rapidly changing or high frequency components. So vibration control hardware makes use of filtering to improve control. And most controllers apply filters during digital signal processing. Nearly all instrumentation in a vibration testing lab is digital, but real world signals are analog. Vibration control hardware digitizes analog signals from the shaker table for processing, and then converts the signals back to analog before outputting the drive. Before digitizing the signal, most control systems apply an analog anti-alias filter to minimize aliasing. Aliasing occurs when a high frequency sine wave appears in the spectrum as a low frequency. Analog anti-alias filters are essentially low pass filters designated to attenuate frequencies above a certain fraction of the sample rate. Attenuation does not immediately drop the value to zero but slopes it downward. Engineers should ensure the attenuation is sufficient for any signal with a frequency greater than or equal to half the sample rate. For instance, if the sample rate is 2000 Hertz, frequencies at or above 1000 Hertz could lead to aliasing. The engineer might struggle to confidently determine if a 1000 Hertz frequency is for example, 1500 Hertz or 500 Hertz. With proper attenuation, they can avoid ambiguity and accurately determine the frequency value. The Vibration View hardware also applies a digital anti-alias filter before digitization, which is an adjustable hardware filter. The analog and digital anti-alias filters eliminate out-of-band energy so the engineer can be confident in the values of the digitized signal. They can trust that 1000 Hertz is 1000 Hertz, not an alias from 10,000 Hertz or some other frequency. So now that the hardware has conditioned the signal, it can perform analog to digital conversion. Control systems can use sampling as a method to digitize a signal. Sampling takes measurements of a vibration waveform at regular intervals and structures the measurements as a sequence of values. After sampling, the control system applies filters specific to the test type. These filters are software programmable and they're what we're going to concentrate our discussion on today. Now each test type has 
different filters that we can use. Today, we'll go over filtering for the fundamental test types, sign, random, and shock. Okay, let's begin with sign vibration testing. Tracking filters is our primary focus when discussing filtering for sign vibration testing. To understand the importance of tracking filters, we need only to remind ourselves of the purpose of sign testing, which is to run a pure sign tone, a single frequency sign tone at a defined amplitude. Now, our test might sweep through a range of frequencies, but it runs one frequency at a time and not simultaneously as it would for random vibration testing. For example, if we run a sine sweep from 5 Hz to 100 Hz at a 1G acceleration, the system should control the test at 1G as it sweeps through each frequency. When running a sine test, we're largely concerned with the control signal's amplitude at each frequency. The control signal helps us identify discrepancies between the drive signal, which the controller outputs, and the response on the shaker table. However, due to the inherent noise of shaker systems, vibration controllers pick up contributions from noise and harmonics in addition to this pure sine tone. Controllers assume all energy relates to the test's entire frequency bandwidth because controllers assume a perfect scenario. If we return to our previous example, let's say there is a harmonic at 100 Hertz contributing 0.5 G and system noise at 50 Hertz contributing 0.3. When the controller sweeps through, say 10 Hertz, it'll conclude that there is an acceleration of 0.8 G. The controller adjusts the drive to account for that reading and outputs the remaining acceleration at 10 Hertz. The controller now measures 1G at 10 Hertz. However, the device under test is not shaking at 1G. The drive acceleration has changed and the test is not running at the desired levels. Now this is an oversimplification because the controller doesn't just add all the acceleration together, but instead calculates an average RMS. However, those noise and harmonics do contribute to the average RMS and can affect the drive. Engineers employ tracking filters to isolate the pure sine tone so the controller can get an accurate amplitude reading at each frequency. Tracking filters are named as such because they track the center frequency. When the controller sweeps up or down, the filter moves with the sweep and only considers the frequency at which the test is running. Applying tracking filters is necessary because we want to control our sign test at the defined amplitude without influence from external factors. Let's move to vibration view for an example. As an example, let's set up a sign sweep from 300 Hertz to 400 Hertz at 1G. On the controller, I looped the output to the input on channel one. I also use the observer as a function generator to generate a 1000 Hertz wave at 1G and fed it into input channel two. Without a tracking filter, the controller reads the acceleration at all frequencies from 300 to 4000 Hertz and controls based on the average RMS. We can see that that 100 Hertz noise will contribute to the average RMS and at some points may affect the control reading. Now, if we apply a tracking filter, going to Edit Test, Advanced, under the Parameters tab, we can set a fractional bandwidth as a percent, and then also a maximum bandwidth. A fractional bandwidth sets the bandwidth of the tracking filter as a percentage of the drive frequency. 
the fractional bandwidth increases as the output frequency increases. The maximum bandwidth sets the, ba sets the maximum allowable bandwidth of the tracking filter. The fractional bandwidth cannot exceed the maximum, and the controller always uses the smaller of the two. Now that we've applied a tracking filter, we can see the shape of the filter and notice that the noise has been filtered out leading up to 1000 Hertz. Since we filtered out that noise, it will not largely contribute to the average RMS outside of that frequency value. Engineers should always apply tracking filters to a sign test. This action will guarantee that their test runs the specified amplitude at the drive frequency. They may still encounter resonance or noise, but with a tracking filter, they can at least confirm that the control is not the issue and narrow down the source. Here are some final notes on tracking filters. Narrow bandwidth tracking filters provide increased filtering and greater stability. Stability can improve performance when sweeping through sharp resonances, but increased filtering comes at the cross comes at the cost of increased response times, which requires more measurement time. Wide bandwidth tracking filters improve performance at extremely low frequencies. Also, tracking filter response time and bandwidth are inversely proportional. Although we can set a response time and a tracking filter bandwidth, performance is limited by this inverse relationship. Let's move on to random vibration testing. Essentially, vibration controllers run a filter over a test's frequency bandwidth to shape a random signal. They form the drive signal by shaping the spectral amplitude of white noise. The shaping function is determined by the demand profile and control system dynamics. In a simple loopback test, the shape of the demand profile defines the three decibel bandwidth of the shaping filter. For example, the power spectral density for a NAVMAT profile is flat from 80 to 350 hertz. Outside this range, the signal falls off at three decibels per octave. It is negative three decibels below the central plateau at 40 and 700 hertz, which defines a negative three bandwidth of 660 for the shaping filter. Now let's quickly look at the effect of our random resolution parameters. If I open a test profile and vibration view, we can view random data within the bandwidth from 20 hertz to 2000 hertz. Technically, the engineer only needs to report on 20 to 2K, but it may be worthwhile to look outside this bandwidth. If I select Edit Graph and navigate to my options, I can deselect Show Only Active Lines. When we do that, we can review what's happening below 20 hertz and above 2K. Now, by default, our lines parameter is 800 at a one-time sample rate. And we can see a few lines outside the test bandwidth. These parameters act as a sort of filter by defining the frequency resolution. But if I edit the test and increase the resolution, we'll be able to see acceleration out to, say, 16 kilohertz. So here I can remove the auto value for the lines 
and the oversampling. And we do suggest that engineers review data outside of the control bandwidth, particularly between 5 to 8 kilohertz, where resonance is likely to occur. So now, yep, we can see data up to that 16 kilohertz. There are other random testing options within the Vibration View software that may necessitate filtering. For example, notching, which differs from low pass or high pass filters in that it removes a narrow band of frequency rather than attenuate frequencies over or under a set value. However, it functions as a filter in that it removes signals at set frequencies. Sign on random testing two. Run sign tones with a random background, and those sign tones require tracking filters just like a sign test. Another example is the fatigue damage spectrum, or FDS, calculation, which applies filters to shape the spectrum. And we have a webinar on that topic if you'd like to learn more. The field data replication, FDR, software, plays back a recorded time history file as a control reference. Typically, the engineer records data in the field, selecting a sample rate that will capture the information they require. During analysis, they'll determine the signal's frequency content and, more specifically, the frequency content they want to run on the shaker. Then they can apply a low pass, high pass, or notch filter to the data stream and adjust the filter while the test is running. When we're applying filtering in shock testing, we're primarily concerned with high frequency noise. It's because shock tests can generate a lot of high frequency noise. In many cases, this noise is consequential to the relative damage of the product because high frequency content is often associated with low velocity or low displacement. Still, there are certain cases where there is significant high frequency noise or low frequency drift in the shock measurements and engineers can apply additional filtering. However, VR does caution engineers to understand their shock test before applying these filters. In Vibration View, we can edit our shock test and navigate to the Channels tab, where we can specify a single bandwidth for all channels or use individual filter settings for each channel. The shock plot can display the signal both with and without the applied filter. Under input filter settings, we can see all of the different options for filters. Um, they all perform differently and there are different reasons for using them, which we could use a whole webinar to discuss that. So engineers can use filters to clean up shock graphs and make them more visually appealing, which is often the reason why individuals add filters to their shock test. But this does run the risk of masking other issues with the control system or otherwise. As such, we do recommend reviewing the data first before applying a filter in shock. Okay, so there are several examples of the sign random and shock filters and vibration testing. If you have any questions from this webinar or need assistance with setting up filtering for your test, please contact us. Our email is vrsales at vibrationresearch.com for product information and support at vibrationresearch.com for support questions. Thanks and have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.